Welcome to the Young Filmmakers Project. I'm Madison Ball, a student at the Vancouver School of Arts and Academics. We're in Mr. Burhouse Digital Cinema production class where students are making movies. Every high school and most middle schools have video production programs where students learn how to shoot and edit video, write scripts, and build graphics, and do live shows. While they do all of that, and they're also building teamwork skills like communication, problem solving, and more. These programs are part of the school district's career and technical education department. Our first film is a documentary about a local man and his work to make Vancouver a greener place. Take a look. So my earliest memory with gardening is probably when I was somewhere between eight and ten, and that was it. When I was growing up, we had uh, a ranch style house in Hazeldell, and uh, we had a little farm going. During my three years with Friends of Trees, um, I was the neighborhood volunteer for. Um, a large portion of Vancouver and I went around, knocked on doors and basically sold the concept of you have this parking strip that's available for street tree planting. So Friends of Trees is a uh, nonprofit organization with the goal of increasing the urban canopy. I got a lot of trees planted in Vancouver. It's, it's been a while, but, but I, I think I've planted about 200 trees in Vancouver. The, I think the average of average number of trees that neighborhood volunteers planted, well, when I was the neighborhood volunteer, was somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 to 30. And I ended up getting the uh, Vancouver Sparkles Award. Vancouver Sparkles is for people that um, have con contributed some kind of significance to Vancouver. So it was like I invested my time and, um, and energy into improving Vancouver and was recognized by the mayor for having the largest tree planting in Vancouver in the history of Vancouver. I've never been one to like meditate, right? I, I've never found that as something, as something I could do and just sit and, and be. I'm kinetic by nature and tactile and there's this the connection to the plants but the actual like act of putting my hands into the soil and tending to the plants that are in the beds like and potting plants but when I think about losing myself in time and space. It's when my hands are in the actual soil and there's that like shift to the right brain and like time evaporates. There's a uh, relationship you establish and gain and grow over time with any living thing, whether it be a pet or a child or plants, you see it grow and change through seasons. It's like you fall, fall in love with something over time because you get familiar <laughs> with it. In, in gardening or potted plants or bonsais, if, I don't, if you don't take care of that, especially the potted part, it'll die. That was a great film. Now I'm joined by Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Hello. Uh, where did you first hear about Troy Harris and why did you make this film? Um, Troy Harris is my father. 
and I made the film about him because I know he has a great love for plants, and um, I wanted to show that to everyone. Great. Uh, what did you learn through making this video? Um, <laughs> I learned. I learned about my dad. I also learned about um, how, like, gardening and plants can really affect someone and like be therapeutic. Uh, what do you like about your video production classes the most? Um, <laughs> I, I just like being able to like experience lots of different, um, I don't know how to say this. I like to be able to um, make something based off of a prompt mm -hmm. and like, I don't know, have experience based off of that. What was your biggest obstacle with this video? Oh, I forgot to set the white balance. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a lot of like color correcting <laughs> throughout that. What was it like to work with your dad on a video? Um, I actually chose him for an interview project because he talks a lot and <laughs> I wanted someone to um, be able to like pick and choose from what they say. Mm -hmm. Like he just talks a lot. So that was easy to. So give us a rundown of your process. What was that like? How did you come up with the idea and filming process and choosing your dad? Uh, just give us all the details. Okay, so we were given the prompt to create a documentary with like interview based. Um, and I chose my dad to interview because he will give a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be able to like pick and choose from what he had to say. Um, and I knew that he was very passionate about gardening and like plants in general, so I thought that that would be a good um, topic to have him talk about. And um, I filmed it in my bedroom. <laughs> um, we like set up all the lighting and a background, and you can't tell it was my bedroom at all. Um, so when I went to film my project, I only brought three lights, so I kind of had to like improvise. Um, because I really wanted a backlighting, but I also wanted like key and like fill and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so a big part, of, like another obstacle that I bumped into while well, during the like production was um, figuring out how to like make it look good with and how I wanted to make it look with mm -hmm. like limited resources. Um, so when I went to light it, I ended up using like my phone flashlight in the background and like other flashlights just all together to like make one seamless looking mm -hmm. kind of thing. <laughs> Thank you, Olivia. You're welcome. <laughs> Our next film is also a documentary and it focuses on a topic near and dear to teenagers' heart, video games. When it comes to gaming consoles, the modern day has the Nintendo Switch, the PlayStation 4, and the Xbox One. But in its infancy, home gaming consoles took the form of stuff like the Magnavox Odyssey and the Intellivision. But amongst the early gaming consoles, the most classic is undoubtedly the Atari 2600. Why they called it the Atari 2600 is beyond me. But needless to say that this console that came out in 1977 was a game changer. Pun entirely intended. With its glorious 4 bits and vast selection of games, this console broke records with over 30 million consoles sold. And how could families in the late 70s and early 80s resist the Atari with a game library with classics like Frogger, Centipede, Pitfall, Backgammon, and Night Driver? I'm gonna be totally honest, I have no idea what's going on here. You play as this thing and try to see inside these lines of rectangles in the eternal void of darkness with... Those cars? Wait, why do they look like actual cars, but you look like the bottom of a Segway? Someone explain, please! <coughs> uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. So the Atari, needless to say, was doing so well that it became a must-have in any family's household. But as Galileo said, what goes up must come down. What? 
You didn't say that? Isaac Newton? I thought he was the E equals MC square guy. Albert who? You see, today's consoles has a thing called quality control. Which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a system companies use to keep only good games on their consoles. That doesn't keep all bad games out, but it was still a better system than what the 2600 had. Because of the lack of quality control, it's no surprise that terrible games like Lost Luggage and I Want My Mommy ended up on the console. But the most infamous of these games is undoubtedly E.T. The development of the game was rushed so it could release close to the movie's release. All the little kitties that love the movie would obviously want to play the game and see E.T.'s magic in video game form, but their enthusiasm was quickly squashed by constantly <coughs> falling <coughs> down <coughs> pits. And look, that game may be bad, but at least it's not escape it. Again, I have no idea what's going on here. You're a square going around a black and white maze that changes every millisecond. You either never run into a wall the entire match or you get stuck in a wall for a good few seconds. This is what was seen as entertainment back then? Oh come on! Because of all these horrendous games, nobody wanted to buy Atari games in fear they would be as bad as E.T. The Atari 2600 stopped production, as were the games, and then came the infamous video game crash of 1983. The video game industry was seen as a dead industry, and it stayed like that for two years. Until one company showed that everyone was wrong. What's it like to play the Nintendo Entertainment System? The Japanese company Nintendo started out manufacturing toys and smaller video game consoles before the crash. But when they released their magnum opus, the Nintendo Entertainment System, in 1985, they redefined gaming, and we owe today's gaming climate to them. Despite the Atari bombing in 83, Atari still tried to come back, and failed. They released the Atari 5200 in 1986 to combat the NES, but it couldn't combat the NES because of how popular it was. The Atari 7800 got plenty of attention and good thoughts when it was unveiled, but had poor marketing backing it up. And the Atari Jaguar? Well, just look at this. What is with Atari and me not understanding anything? Despite nearly putting an end to gaming, Atari is still in business under new management, and the 2600's legacy is still remembered to this day. For better or for worse. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places, worn out. Nice job, guys. Our next film is a thriller about a day of fun gone wrong. Check it out.
you need me to catch you at the end? Alright, well my parents are here to pick me up. Bye.
Our final film is a challenging technical exercise. It's an action film shot completely in one take. Take a look. Do this. Don't worry. My boss wants you alive. Oh, oh no. My, my boss is gonna kill me! past episodes of the show on the district youtube channel that's youtube.com forward slash fantasy tv just look for the young filmmakers playlist thanks for watching the young filmmakers project until next time i'm madison ball